remember just a few minutes ago, I had a flashback of my old life and my present life merged into one. I was reminded of my life being a photographer again. <laughs> and I remember one time, one person asked me, Jem, aren't uh, missionaries supposed to have a tent-making business? That's what, that's what they asked me. Aren't, are we supposed to have a tent-making business? And you know what? What I said, if God reveals to you that you have to have a tent-making business, then do so. Amen. But if God reveals to you that you have to have a full and total reliance on the Lord every step of the way, then do so. There's no cooker, cookie cutter for everyone. Each one of us is called to do something. And you know what's quite interesting? I'm not a lazy person because I'm just leaning on the Lord for everything. Leaning on the Lord for everything was quite a challenge for me because I was brought up to somehow fend for myself at a very early age, at the age of six. I guess I mentioned this in the first few nights that, that I was speaking. At age of six, I was already selling stuff back home. I was a businessman at the age of six. And my business strategy was this. Would you like this? <laughs> and people say, you're so cute, let me have five. <laughs> so at the age of seven, when I went to school, I was already buying, buying rice cakes at 2.30 in the morning. My mother will wake me up, buy rice cake, and then bring it back home because we have a little canteen. And the rest of the rice cakes, I bring it back to my school. So I was a businessman at the age of seven. So for me, looking for money is not a problem. And especially when you are in photography, and I don't have a business card, what I do is somehow because of my relationship with people, people will just recommend one after another. And, and at the time that I became a missionary, you know what the Lord did? The Lord broke my camera. <laughs> he knows for a fact that that's the only way for me to fully depend on Him. Mm. He knows that I'm a hard-headed missionary. So He got me to the point that I don't have anything to rely on except Him. And you know what's the most amazing thing is when he broke my camera, I was in a youth conference, and then I just looked up to the Lord and say, full time, huh? That was just like my cue. I need you to be full time. So when I went in for the missionary work, the Lord replaced my broken camera with a new one. Isn't God amazing? And when I got a new one, a friend of mine who is a manager of a mall back in the Philippines, there is like a, an American Idol type of competition in that mall. And he wants me to take a picture. And I said, go hire other photographers. No, no, I don't trust them. I only trust you. I said, no, go. I'm retired. I said, no, I'll pay you more. Even if you pay, more, pay me more, I can't. But for the sake of friendship, I took on the job. You know what happened? Worst case scenario happened. No, it's, it's not the, the camera that broke. I don't have any inspiration to take pictures. It was the ugliest pictorial that I've ever taken. It was no inspiration at all. But then a friend asked me, Jem, could you take pictures of our, of our wedding? Because we don't have much money. And when it's free, I'm inspired. But when it comes to raising money now for myself, the Lord took that joy away. Why? Because the Lord wanted me to rely on Him. For me, it is easier to find money for myself. Relying on the Lord was a challenge, was out of my comfort zone. God took me out of my comfort zone that I may learn to depend on Him. Sometimes we may be complaining, oh, this is difficult. Oh, this is difficult. You know what? God is taking you out of your comfort zone because He's teaching you something beautiful. Amen? Amen. With that being said, let us kneel down for the prayer. Our great God, our dear loving Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much that you have been so faithful to us every step of the way, every single night, every single minute of every hour, you have been with us. It is you that inspired us, Lord, not my testimonies. You are the reason for these testimonies. Without you, this will just be mere stories. But Lord, I praise you and I thank you that you have been 
with us, with me, every step of the way. And Lord, I praise you and I thank you that this story is not exclusive for me. Each of us will have a story to tell or maybe some of us right now have a story to tell. Dear Father, I pray that you please open doors for your children to brag about how wonderful their God is, to brag about how marvelous, how almighty you are. And thank you so much, Lord, for hearing and answering our prayers. And I pray once again, dear Father, that you please hide me behind the shadow of your cross, that I will not be seen or be heard, but Jesus and Jesus alone be seen, be heard, be lifted up and exalted. For we pray this in the loving name of your son, Jesus, all your children say, Amen. Amen. I love this, this song. I know I began to love this song like last year when I arrived in the Philippines on, uh, I guess, March. And I was called to do a week of prayer in Adventist University of the Philippines. You, you listened to the story yesterday. A college invited me. That's a college of dentistry. I said, Kuya Jem. Can you do a week of prayer? Uh, no. Can you do a, a special Sabbath for us? And I said, okay, uh, let's, let's do it before I fly out of the country again. And then two days before my arrival, actually, I planned to arrive in Manila a week before they asked me to do uh, that, uh, that special Sabbath. And then two days before my arrival, they gave me a call. Oh, Kuya Jem, there's a slight change in a program. I said, okay, what's a slight change? It's not going to be a special Sabbath. Then what's it going to be? It's going to be a week of prayer. And I said, hmm, that's not slight. <laughs> that's a huge change. And then they have a theme. And I said to them, can we change your theme? I said, what, what's the theme you have in mind? I have uh, like absolute reliance. I said, why absolute reliance? And I told them, because I have to absolutely rely on God for everything that I need to speak to you. I don't have a topic to, to speak to you, so pray for me. And every single day, they did not just have me speak for the nightly meeting. They also planned out for me to speak in their early morning classes, like three or four classes, and they asked me to speak five to ten minutes per day, so like four classes, and also morning devotionals of the girls' dorm at 5 a.m., Yes, their devotionals there starts at 5 a.m. So just imagine our first devotional session. This, these girls came to the worship hall, and they were just like, they're not wanting to be there, but they're forced to be there because their attendance are checked. And the song that was sang for opening song, "'Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus,' and they're singing it this way. "'Tis so sweet to trust.'" There's no sweetness in their faces nor in their voices. <laughs> And I was leading, reading the lyrics of the song. And then for the first time in 30 plus years, that song really hit me during that morning. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word. Just to rest upon his promise. Just to know, thus saith the Lord. And I begin to realize most of the time we're singing the songs, these hymns, but we're really not taking it to heart. Huh? We're just singing this, this song, but this song is full of beautiful messages. And that's how we become hypocrites. We're singing the songs, we're memorizing the verses, but not really fully believing it. We say, with God, nothing is impossible. Really? Or it is so sweet, but there's no sweetness in our faces. I surrender all. Hmm. We're the biggest hypocrites, aren't we? But that very morning, it really hit me. What if we really take God at His word? What if we really rest in His promises? Man, life would be sweeter. Amen? Amen? So, and I learned as well that when God takes a hold of our plans, it means to say all. Sometimes, He reroutes our our direction. Sometimes we think that we're going this direction, but God will somehow reroute our direction. I remember 2015, and I was quite uh, nervous for my second time going back to, to the U.S. I was invited to go to the GC session, and apart from, from being a member of the prayer team, the GC asked me to be one of the speakers for, for prayer 
seminar. And I felt so small. I'm already small. Not just small, I'm little. And I was, I was together with a group of, of big names in the Seventh-day Adventists with Ivor Myers, Ruthie Jacobson, Melody Mason. I forgot some of, of the names, but they are well-known people. And there's this little guy who nobody knows except maybe my church or my town. And, and I felt so, Lord, I'm not worthy to be here. And then I was scheduled to stay in the U.S. for four months. The only schedule that I have was GC session and GC annual council for the prayer team. That's July and October in between nothing. And I'm thinking, Lord, what should I do? And I always come to the Lord when, when I need some direction. And I don't want to go ahead of God. I know going ahead of the Lord is always a disaster. I've tried it. I have like a long week testimonies of how I failed. And it's crazy. And I think, Lord, I should not be going ahead of you. And I'm also thinking my own ways. I said, Lord, should I babysit my, my niece's child? Or should I house it my friend's house that I could stay longer in, in the U.S. without incurring a lot of expenses. All these ideas, the Lord did not give me peace. And remember, when you don't have peace, it means to say that it's not God's ideas. So I said, okay, Lord, what do you want me to do? And during GC session, we are so busy, my dear friends. We have to walk from the hotel to the Alamo Dome, and that will take us nearly 30 minutes wearing this and these shoes, not tennis, these shoes. So it, it's quite warm in Texas. And every time we, we have to be there at 6.30 in the morning, before all the delegates arrive, we have to pray for the, whole, for the whole thing. And we have to stay there and we have to close down at 8. And sometimes people will come and pray with you and you get out of the Alamo Dome at around 9. And go back to your room. And when there's four of you in the room together with Joseph, so you could not sleep early. <laughs> we, sometimes we sleep at 10.30, 11. And we have to wake up at 4.00. And I'm thinking, Lord, I need to know your direction. What do you want me to, to do? And the Lord just gave me this one verse. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And I'm thinking, so what do you want me to do, Lord? Go a little bit earlier that I'm waking up right now. And the Lord reminded me, seek ye first the kingdom of God. I said, okay. Then I woke up at three. And I was sleeping only for four or three hours. Seeking where do you want me to go? Because, my dear friends, if you want to seek the Lord's will, you have to seriously seek Him. Amen? Amen? Amen. This not just happen like, Lord, give me one. No, it does not happen that way. You have to seek Him. And most especially, you have to come to Him to ask Him to empty you of your own plans, of your own desire. It's difficult for you to be led when you know where you're going. So, I gave that to the Lord and I said, Lord, I'm, I really don't know what to do. And the Lord was silent. For the next week, the Lord was silent, my dear friends. And I still don't know what to do, where I'm going to go after the GC session. And the more I plead with God, the more the Lord is giving me silent treatment. And then I know I learned something. When the Lord is silent, it means to say, I've spoken a lot. I've spoken too much. The Lord reminded me of this verse in Psalm 46, be still and know that I am God. Amen. So I, I just sat and be still. Okay, Lord, I'm, I'm trying to be still right now, but my heart is racing 100 miles per hour. Please, just one destination, Lord. Let me know where you want me to go. And the Lord just somehow impressed me with this thought. Just wait until you give, after you give your, your prayer seminar. And I'm thinking, Oh, Lord. And my prayer seminar will not happen until next day, next, next Wednesday, Wednesday next week. And you know what that date, what was happening on that date? It was the time that they will discuss women's ordination. And I'm thinking, oh, Lord, who will attend my seminar? People are closing their exhibit hall just to attend there. And my seminar fell on lunchtime. Who would sacrifice their lunchtime to go and listen to somebody who... They don't know. And I was thinking, oh, it's just going to be me and Joseph talking to one another because Joseph was, was the one in charge of audio recording. I'm ready to speak to Joseph, Lord, if it's just me and him. 
where two or three are gathered, you are in the midst of us. Amen? But me and my unbelief, the moment we started, there were more than a hundred people who were there in the seminar. And I'm thinking, maybe they're lost. <laughs> maybe they're heading for, for another seminar. Maybe they're, they're just lost. And people were asking me, oh, so this is the abiding seminar because we are really excited. Said, yes. We want to hear what you have to say. And you know what, my dear friends, when the Lord says so, the Lord will do so. After the seminar, people just came and invited me. Jem, can you go to Romania? Jem, can you go to, to Africa? Jem, can you go to India? And my weeks begin to fill up. And one person invited me. Jem, if ever the Lord brings you to Florida, to Orlando, let me know and I'll hook you up with a nice room. And I said, oh, it's okay, but there's no invitation for me to go to, to Orlando. Not that I know of. Make long story short again. I was on my trips now, and I was scheduled to go to fly back. And the Lord, by the way, the Lord provided all the airfares. My whole week were booked. No, my whole three months in between were booked. All the weeks were scheduled. And one person, one church just begged for me, Jim, please empty one week and, and come back to, to Houston to speak to our church again. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but it's all booked. But somehow the Lord compelled me to empty that, that week. I said to the, to the other person, I'm sorry, but I can come back to your place, but there is like a needed task that needs to get done in this place. And you know what happened? They canceled out on me. I cleared out the week and the person that asked me, that begged me, canceled out that week. And I got somehow a bit irritated. And I'm thinking, Lord, what is this? I canceled out an important event there to be because I thought that that's going to be more important. And then they canceled out on me. And then I didn't know that the Lord was rerouting my trip. And I was not happy because my mind was already set up to go somewhere else. And remember this verse that I gave to you last uh, a couple of hours ago. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way that thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Amen? Amen? All the while, I thought that that verse is just good for people who are lost. Or people who are about to take their exams. <laughs> Instruction, isn't it? People who need wisdom. I don't need that much wisdom. <laughs> I'm not that lost. And then I discovered I'm lost. All of us are lost, aren't we? Who among you here was going to know what's going to happen next week? No one. How about tomorrow? Not after 10 minutes. How about two minutes? Nothing knows. Who among you knows that I'm going to do this? No one. Only God knows. And isn't it wise to take God's offer that He will instruct us? And teach us in the way that we should go. And he will what? Guide us with his own eye. He did not say, I will send you a GPS. I will bless Siri. No, he, will, he said that I will guide you with my own eye. He himself promised. And when he is the one guiding, my dear friends, will you ever get lost? No. Will you ever regret the journey? Uh-uh. Will you ever regret the destination? No, never. Like the song, no, no, never, never, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Never, my dear friends. You will never, ever regret anything if the Lord is the one leading you. But during that time, all the while, I thought that the Lord has led and I took it to heart and thinking, oh, this is, this is done deal. And now when it did not work out, I grumbled. I was not happy. And lo and behold, you know where the Lord led me? Orlando. <laughs> the Lord asked me to be there because of a small prayer group that's happening in Orlando. And that prayer group is led out by one Adventist and everyone in the member are not Seventh-day Adventists. So that small group. And then when I, when I uh, accept that invitation, actually that invitation came from the lady who invited me if I pass by Orlando. 
I just went to Orlando because a friend of mine that I have not seen for nine years invited me to go to Miami. So from Miami, it's just a bus ride away from Orlando. So I went there. And now I told my friend, hey, I'm coming to, to Orlando. And this friend that I just met in the GC session, later on I found out that uh, she was an ex-FBI officer. So, and she booked me in this place. And my friend drove me to this resort. She, she, she said that I'll, I'll, uh, I'll set you up in a nice accommodation. And I did not imagine that the accommodation is very, very nice. The moment I reached the resort, my jaw just dropped. I, re I forgot all the instruction. <laughs> I asked my friend, did you remember? I said, uh-uh. So both of us just went to the garden and asked, where is this place located? Lo and behold, we went to the, to the clubhouse. And, and I was not asked to line up in the regular reception. I was escorted to the office. And I did not even know that my accommodation was elite accommodation. And they brought me to my room. This is, I, I did not really realize that this resort was the biggest timeshare resort in the world. So I went and, and I saw my bed. My dear friends, my bed was huge. <laughs> this small body does not need huge bed. I could sleep on a rug. I would fit in a rug. But this bed is so big. He said, Lord, I would even get lost in my own bed here. And then when I opened, I, there's two doors. The, the one door was the closet, so I put my bags in, and I checked the bathroom. When I opened the bathroom door, I saw, what is this? There's a hallway, and I went in. And all the while, I thought that it's like an adjacent room, that the other room forgot to close their door. So I said, hello? Anybody home? Hello? And then I, I begin to discover, this is still part of my room. I have my own kitchen. I have my own dining room. I have my own living room. And I went into my, to my what's this, to my, to my bathroom. When I opened my bathroom, my dear friends, I saw the biggest bathtub in my life. <laughs> and I said, Lord, three more Filipinos could fit in this bathtub. <laughs> and I said, I could do backstroke here. <laughs> Friends, by the way, when I started my missionary work, when I tasted the missionary life, I have one request from the Lord. Lord, every time I go, I want a mission, not a vacation. Because once you have tasted mission, my dear friends, vacation becomes boring. Could you say amen? amen. Yeah, for those of you who have not tasted missions, oh, my dear friends, it's like, it's like tasting fried rice <laughs> and then you are offered plain rice and you have fried rice on the left. Where would you go? Fried rice, of course. <laughs> you tasted something better. And that's why I said to the Lord, Lord, I want missions, not vacation. And I was there enjoying my hot tub and I begin to remember, Lord, didn't I ask for missions, not vacation? But I'm not complaining. <laughs> I don't have this every day. <laughs> So, and there's one thing that I've learned as well. In the U.S. or in the first world, even though you have the most beautiful hotel, breakfast is not assured. Mm. Huh? In Asia, even though you have a very, very cheap hotel, you have at least egg and rice breakfast, at least cereal and some milk breakfast. I'm not promoting egg and rice or cereal and milk, but I didn't have breakfast. So I remember I have to go and look for a place to buy for breakfast. So that afternoon, I walked towards Target. And Target is like a mile and a half away. And I didn't have a car. I don't know how to drive. Remember, I was born to be driven and not to drive. And I walked towards Target. You know where? I walked on the highway. I was so naive. I, I, all the while, I thought, this is Philippines. So I walk in the highway, and then a a truck passed by. And when the truck passed by so fast, my dear friends, I was imagining that my soul left my body. <laughs> I nearly fell off the ditch. It was so strong. It's, this is dangerous, Lord. And I started walking, walking on the grass. <laughs> and then later on, I told my friends, oh, you know what? I, and they said, Jim, 
we know that you're crazy, but we never really realized that you are that crazy. You could have been killed. And I said, I know. <laughs> but there's no way for me to, to have breakfast, just but, but to go there. And then I realized later on that you could ride a shuttle from, from where we are to go to the other side of the resort. My dear friends, this resort is big. It's like a two-mile resort. You have to go to the other side. It has like three stoplights to the other side, and then they'll drop you off, and across the street is Target. So I did that, and it is summer. So Target is like 500 to 600 meters away, and I went back with my plastic bags. It's heavy, and it's hot. It's like Philippines. And I waited and waited there in that uh, checkpoint. 30 minutes, no bus. And I'm thinking, what's happening here? And I asked the guard, excuse me, how, how many times did the bus passes here? I said, oh, this is not a regular route for the bus. They only come here when there's somebody who had a special request to be dropped off here, like me. And then I said, so where is the next stop? I said, oh, it's like 700 meters away. And I'm thinking, Lord, I'm too tired, I'm too dehydrated, and I'm too lazy. I could not go any farther, and this is too heavy. And I'm asking, Lord, you have promised. I will instruct you and teach you. I need your instruction right now. What should I do? And there's this faint voice, and I did not believe it was God at first. Hitchhike. <laughs> hitchhike? And then I begin to realize, hitchhike going in. The resort is safer, isn't it? And I'll just be dropped after 750 meters. And I said, okay. And I hitchhiked. And now I know why the Lord had me hitchhike. Because every time I step off the vehicle, the Lord compelled me to pray for my drivers. And that became my routine every day. I said, Lord, thank you so much for this mission. Every single day I ride and I pray for people who brings me to that pit stop. Last day. On my last day, I told God, Lord, I need a special mission right now. This is going to be my last mission, so please give me a good one. And I was waiting there, and this SUV stopped, and the driver was a woman. I'm thinking, Lord, I didn't have a woman driver before. Most of them are men, so are you sure that this is the one? And the Lord somehow confirmed it that, Okay, go and approach. And I asked the woman, excuse me, can you drop me off at the river island? It's just a few meters from here. And she was hesitant. Of course she was hesitant. I'm a guy and she's a girl. Even though I'm a little guy, I'm still a guy. <laughs> so she, was, she looked at me and then she looked at the guard. And then she asked for the guard, excuse me, please come. And then she asked me already to sit with her. Excuse me, guard, please come over. And the guard came and I said, Ma'am, what's that? I said, guard, if something happens to me, just remember who I'm with. <laughs> and I looked at the guard too, and I said, if something happens to me too, just remember who I'm with. <laughs> so we drove. And this lady, while she was driving, I told her, you know what? God will surely bless you, ma'am, because you have been so good to, to his missionary. I said, oh, you're a missionary. She began driving slow. This is like a 10 miles per hour speed limit. And then she went like five miles per hour. And then I, and she asked me, tell me about it. When she said, tell me about it, it's like this, the bell that rang, ding, 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 testimony time. <laughs> so I begin sharing my testimony. And I have a one minute, five minute, 15 minute, 30 minute, one day version of testimony. So of course, I planned out my one minute version of testimony. So I was sharing that to her, and the woman begins to extend because she was driving slow, and now it was time for me to be dropped off. It's, it's a short distance. And the moment I was about to be dropped off, I told her, oh, ma'am, I'm okay here. I said, no, 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 I will drive you to your, to your place. I said, no, no, it's the exact opposite of where you live because she lives in the north, I live in the south. It will take like 15 minutes, not because that it's so far, but it's because the speed limit is so slow and there's like, traffic in that resort and then she told me no 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 i'll take you no 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 drop me off him. no 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 i'll take you and that that ping pong went on and on and said no just shut up let's go <laughs> and then she told me okay no no go tell me more tell me more and she drove and we had like 15 to 20 minutes of testimony time and she kept on saying 
wow, wow, God is amazing, wow. And now before I got off, and by the way, remember, this is, this is Clubhouse, and Clubhouse has two drop-offs because it's the busiest building in the whole place. That's a reception for all the guests. And before she dropped me off, I told her, excuse me, Sarah, I cannot get off your vehicle until I pray for you. And I said, oh, okay, that's a first for me. So I closed my eyes, folded my hands, and asked the Lord, Lord, please speak through me, pray through me. I don't have any words except you put it in my words, in my, in my mouth. It was just like a 30-second prayer. And when I opened my eyes, I saw Sarah folding her hands, saying, wow, wow, wow. This has never happened to me before. I've been coming back and forth to this resort for 10 years. This has never happened to me before. This is the best vacation in my life. So, Jim, thank you so much. She asked me one thing. Can I give you a hug? And I said, no. <laughs> of, course, <laughs> of course, I said, yes. <laughs> I gave her a hug, my dear friends. And just imagine, she gave me a tight hug. Just imagine a few minutes before, she doesn't want to give me a ride. She was suspicious, but that 15 minutes turned around Sarah's life. Then she said, give me a hug. Thank you so much. When I got off, wo waved my hand, and then Sarah, I could still see her holding her, her wheel. She saying, wow. Wow, wow. And then the cars behind her, ee, ee, ee. wow, wow. <laughs> a few more seconds, Sarah drove off. And then I think, wow, Lord, this is the reason why you rerouted my trip. It's because of Sarah. It's because of those people that you want me to pray with. It's God amazing, isn't he? Amen. He knows we're supposed to go. He knows the best mission for us to go. Amen? Amen? And the best thing about it, you don't have to worry about the direction because He has it. All you have to do is what? Lord, where? All you have to do is be ready, be surrendered, be submissive. Now, before I leave this resort, this resort is amazing actually. Before I leave this resort, more and more testimony. When you are invited to be a guest in a timeshare resort, you have one responsibility, and that is to attend timeshare seminar. Right. Did you get that? Because they want to sell you timeshares. And I was supposed to attend one, and I'm thinking, this is going to be pointless. I don't have the money to buy timeshare, and it's going to be a waste of my time. It's going to be a waste of their time. But they are so persistent. They'll tell you, it's only 30 minutes. They're lying. It's going to be half a day. Huh? 30 minutes? Mm-mm. It's going to be so long. And they call you three days before. They call you a day before. And the day itself, five minutes, there's an, five minutes before, there's a knock on your door. And five minutes before, lo and behold, somebody knocked at my door. And this is the guy. I'll tell you later how I got his picture. But, <laughs> but this is the guy who was, who was knocking on my door. Wait. Let me. This was the guy who was knocking on my door. He's like six foot two. He's like, he's like Superman. It's, he has big muscles like me, you know. <laughs> He has huge muscles, and then he's tall, and he's like very erect kind of guy. And he said, Mr. Castor, I said, yes, sir, I'm your agent. Oh. I have an agent. And he walks in front of me, and I walk behind him. I look like I have a bodyguard. I look like a Chinese drug lord walking behind him. So, and he brought me to this place where he will discuss the matter with me. He sat me down. And then he said, he asked me the question, uh, Mr. Castor, and I asked him, just call me Jem. It's, it's so shameful that you, 
he calls you with so much for, uh, formality and later on he found out you don't have any money. <laughs> <laughs> so just call me Jem. So he told me, okay, Mr. Jem, I just want to ask you, how often do you do vacations like this? And I said, every week. And then when he heard every week, he, he got so excited. He could see that that contained excitement like, like this is it, every week. So, and then he asked me the next question. How much do you spend for vacations like this? Why are you laughing? <laughs> you think I could not afford? You're right. <laughs> and I told him, nothing. I said, what? I said, nothing. I said, nothing? Yes, nothing, zero, nada. I said, oh, why? And I told him, I'm a missionary. I could not afford vacations like this. It's only because of God's goodness that he made me go places like, like this, beautiful. And then when he heard that I'm a missionary, his gestures began to change. Put down his pen, put down his paper, begin to be like this. He asked more questions. And again, the bell rang, ding, 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 testimony time. <laughs> so that whole day was testimony day. And, and then he, that's a one-day version, Sue. That's my timeshare version. So he kept on asking. And, and while asking, he began to open up. He began telling me about his failed marriage in Colombia. He told me about the two kids that he missed back home. He told me about the failed marriages that he had again and again and again. He told me about this dog-eat-dog -dog world type of work, this real estate. And he told me that he missed going back to church. For like six or seven years, he has not gone back to church. He was a faithful Catholic boy. And then he told me, oh, by the way, Jem, we have, I have to take you to, an, to other beautiful villas. I have to show you. But don't worry, we don't have to talk about timeshare. We don't have to talk about business. We can continue talking about this. Amen. So we went around, and we just talked and talked and talked. We talked about God. We talked about religion. We talked about the miracles that's happening in my life. And then when we came back, I said, oh, by the way, Jem, my manager wants to close the deal with you. So, so please, this is SOP. I don't know. He's not going to be closing any deal. But just, just bear with it. And the manager sat me down and, and gave me a hypothetical question. He said, if ever you will receive a huge amount of money, will you invest it in timeshare? And I said, no. <laughs> I said, where will you invest it? And I said, missions. I said, okay, okay, let's change the question. What if, if you have a new career? And I said, I don't want another career. I'll die as a missionary. <laughs> and then this manager now realized that this guy is hopeless. So he ended the conversation, led me through. And then while we were walking, walking back to, this, to his golf cart, Andres told me, Andres is his name. I said, oh, Jem, uh, I have one request. I know I could not ask much from you, but I have one simple request. I said, what's that, Andres? Can you include me in your prayer? Wow. I told him, you know what? I have a better idea. Let's go back to my room. A room where you picked me up, let's pray there. When we were there, we knelt down, put my hand over and dress. And I told him, let's pray, brother. And I prayed for him. I asked the Lord to pray through me. And after that prayer, my dear friends, I stood up. I got a DVD from Taj Paklev, stuff that I gotten from, from GC session. And then I got another book. I forgot what book was that. And then I gave it to him and I said, Andres, I am so sorry, dear brother, that I've wasted your time. You could have closed other deals and other clients, but somehow you fall into my lap. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I just, I did not make any deal. I did not close any deal with you. And Andres said, Jem, what are you talking about? I just made the biggest deal in my life right now. Isn't that amazing? The Lord rerouted my trip because he wants me to reach Andres. Amen. We emailed each other, but I'm so bad when it comes to corresponding. I have a lot of people to correspond with. And a year after, I saw Andres gave me like a friend request on Facebook, and then another message on Instagram, and I saw, oh, this is Andres, this is my bodyguard. <laughs> and, and later on, 
he we communicated a bit and i checked his facebook uh wall that's why i that's how i got his picture his facebook cover photo was do not forget what god has done for you and i went through all his wall it's all religious post and i'm thinking lord this is amazing you do not have to to show this to me but because you are so good you allow me to see this that i'd be inspired to follow you even with full heart with even the next heart that i don't think i don't have lord this is just amazing my dear friends walking with god is the best thing that you could ever experience amen and i the thing that i was dreading about the useless meeting became a life-changing meeting for one person. This is one good thing that I, re- that I learned from God. Friends, when God is the one leading your way, even the, the most ordinary situation would be transformed into something extraordinary. Anything that is being led by God would become an adventure. Can you say Amen. And just imagine, and I could not imagine how many extraordinary experiences that I have missed out on because I thought I knew where I was going. Because I was not letting God lead my way. How many extraordinary moments that we have missed, that we have let us pass by because we are so fond following our own way, following our own desire, following what we think is right. Sad thing, isn't it? My dear friends, it's not too late. God wants us to experience this every single day. Amen? Because what He wants you to experience is a continual miracle in your life. Not that people will appreciate you, but people will see who is the God that you serve. People wants, God wants for you to brag about Him. Amen. Amen? There was one time, my dear friends, I was, those were the moments that I feel really, really small. I'm already small, but sometimes I feel really small. And I'm thinking, Lord, why did you pick me to go around and speak, uh, speak about you? There's a lot of big names there. And when I, when I, when I speak, and when I think that, oh, everything is going really, really good, and then I check because people upload it in YouTube. When I check what I've spoken in YouTube, I said, oh, Lord, what did I say? Oh, Lord, why? How? And I'm thinking, oh, Lord, it's only by your grace that you're using me. The manner that I speak is not desirable even for me. Only by God's grace. And then the Lord somehow revealed to me, it is because you know how to brag about me. Amen? It doesn't matter, my dear friends. Even if, if we stutter, even if we look crazy, even if we don't sound good, even if our English is broken, even if our grammar is not right, as long as you are right with God, as long as you are bragging about Him and not you, that's all that matters. Because Jesus needs to shine. People need to hear about Him. Amen. Enough about us. It should be about Him. Amen? Amen? I went back to the Philippines on October, and the GC called me back again to somehow uh, volunteer in the Re- Revival and Reformation booth for GYC in Kentucky. And on my flight back to the U.S., and this was the time while they were, they were trying to fix the overpass, the Skyway in Manila. And Manila is, is quite a f- packed. <laughs> Manila, Philippines, it's, it's very, very traffic. So traffic. And, and it's funny because when and people in the U.S. say, oh, man, it's traffic. And I said, where? <laughs> Friends, you have not seen traffic. If you have not been in Manila, huh? Traffic means you have to eat your lunch on the jeepney. Traffic means you have to be, to be there, like stand still like for an hour, not moving more than 10 meters. That's traffic. So it was 
it was bad because they were fixing that uh, the skyway and half of the road was eaten up by construction. It's already traffic and now half of the road is eaten with cons by construction. And I'm thinking, oh Lord, I don't want to be late for my flight. And I chose the early morning flight that I would be safe. So I chose the 4 a.m. flight. So at 11, at 11, I was already waiting for the taxi. And the taxi cost so much. They charged me so much because they thought I was Korean. <laughs> and I told them, I'm a local. And they charged me with, supposedly it's like 120 pesos from my place, from the place where I'm staying to the airport. They charged me 600 pesos. So Koreans, you know how to, how to haggle when you're in the Philippines. Go for 80% discount. So, and I told them, no, 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 this is not, this is only, a, a, sorry, it's, sorry, I'm sorry, it's traffic. It's 11 o'clock. And they said, it's still traffic. And I was waiting for like 45 minutes until this guy said, sir, it's take it or leave it, 300. I said, okay. And I was angry. And I was just like feeling, so, I was taken advantage of. Like, how dare this guy take the money of a missionary? <laughs> And I was not happy. I was like, mm. And then while he was driving, he was giving me all his bad experiences of the day. And I'm thinking, you want me to listen to your bad experiences because you want to have extra tip? Uh-uh. No way. And, and he was going on and on for the next 10 minutes until I got like really irritated. And I told him, I rebuked him. And I told him, you know what, brother? I have not even received salary for the past five years. And then he just looked at me. You don't have any salary, but you're flying on an international flight. And I said, because I'm a missionary. And then he said, oh, you're a missionary. Tell me about it. And I was sharing my... I did not even realize that that was a ding, ding, ding moment already. <laughs> and I was sharing being a missionary while I was irritated. And I did not even realize that the Lord is using me even though I was not willing to share. Mm. And, and he began to, and I realized that that was a ding, ding, ding moment in the middle of our conversation. And I said, okay, Lord, forgive me. So I was sharing to him what the Lord has done in my life. And he opened up to me about his failed marriage, that his wife left him for another guy. His wife is working abroad and no, so, so he gave me all this burden. And then later on, oh, by the way, we had a 45-minute conversation. So he had a 45-minute version of the testimony. The moment I, before I step off his taxi, I, I asked him, excuse me, Kuya, like older brother, can I pray for you? I said, uh, uh, uh. He doesn't know how to respond, so I just put my hand <laughs> over his shoulder and said, dear Lord, please pray with my brother. <laughs> And after I said that prayer, I saw him folding his hands. And the same reaction like Sarah, he said, wow, wow, this has never happened to me before. So I said, thank you, Kuya, God bless. I went out of the car, tried to open the trunk, but the trunk was closed because he was still, wow. I said, brother, I want my bags. <laughs> He opened the trunk, helped me out of my bug, bags, and then it told me, brother, no, he charged me, of course. <laughs> he told me, brother, I hope you could ride in my taxi again. I gave him a hug. I told him, God bless you. And I gave him a tip. <laughs> so I went, I went to, to the airport. I went to the terminal. I was pulling my bags, and it hit me. I almost missed my mission. I ask God every trip to give me a mission and not a vacation, but because I was so focused on the injustice that was done to me, I, was, I almost missed my mission. My dear friends, the enemy of souls will always use ourselves to distract us from the work that God has given us. So while I was there, I said, Lord, please forgive me. It is only by God's goodness, my dear friends, that He still uses us. Amen? He could have used angels and he will not have any problem. Why does he condescend to use us? You know why? Because God is not so greedy with the joy 
He wants you to experience the joy. Amen? Amen. The, the angels could not wait to do what God is asking us to do. But then they are being stopped of doing what we're supposed to do because God wants us to experience the joy. Amen? Amen? So while I was there in the airport waiting for my flight, I, I heard people talking, chit-chatting, and it began to grow. Oh, you know what that means? Somebody important just came in. Somebody popular just came in. And when I looked to my left, you know Philippines is very, very big on beauty contests. Huh? Pageants. Yes, there's a lot of beauty queens from the Philippines. Even in our small street, there's a beauty pageant. Even in our, our street, they have like, uh, what do you call this? A recycling stuff or something where you, where you put all the bottles and uh, the metals. They just put a stage and there's like a pageant over there. That's how big Philippines in pageants. And this lady is one of the first beauty queens in the Philippines. She is, she is also an actress, a producer, a director, and their family is involved in politics. So she's big name. Her name is Melanie Marquez. And, and she came in together with her family and her PA. And, and when she passed by, the line was already long. When she passed by, the Lord convicted me. That's your next mission. I said, uh-uh-uh. <laughs> but that lady walked, and the lady stopped at the end of the line. And I said, Lord, look at this. She's so far. <laughs> And when we arrive in Beijing, remember, I'm going back to, to the U.S. I'm flying to New York. And because this is a cheap flight, cheap flight most of the time has long layover, and it's Beijing. I had an 11-hour layover. And in Beijing, if you have noticed, when you pass by China, even if you'll not stay in China, you will pass through this passport check. Huh? They will, they will check you. And then you'll be lining up for another like 30 minutes or one hour. It's a good thing if you don't have that much, if you have much time. But sometimes if you are running for, for like a, a layover, a, a quick layover, you're, you're in a bad situation. But I don't have anything to worry. I have 11 hours layover. And while I was lining up, lo and behold, when I turned around, it was Melanie Marquez behind me. And the Lord spoke to me, now it's your time. I said, okay, Lord, how should I begin this conversation? And then I took out my phone and I said, Miss Melanie, I said, yes, can we do selfie? <laughs> we took selfie and that somehow broke the ice and we begin to talk. And of course, there's a lot of Filipinos in that flight. They were wondering, I guess, who's the new boyfriend of Melanie Marquez? <laughs> it's quite short. <laughs> Melanie is quite tall. And then while we were, while we were conversing, uh, we laughed about, about life. She talked to me about her family, about this, about that. 30 minutes after the line, we, we part ways. I said, bye, Melanie. I said, bye, Jem. <laughs> We're close now. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we went our way, and I somehow caught up with my, with my devotions. That morning, I was so caught up with a lot of things that I missed out on devotions. Lord, this time is yours. So I spent like seven to eight minutes with the Lord slept, read, even listened to music, listened to sermons. And afterwards, I was going around the airport and the PA of Melanie saw me and said, Oi, Kuya, sir, Miss Melanie is looking for you. I said, she's looking for me. <laughs> What's that? And then he told, she told me, she wants help with her MacBook. And I'm thinking, oh Lord, I'm a PC user. And I'm not even that good when it comes to technical stuff. But she called me. So I went and make the long story short, I was useless. <laughs> and we just laughed. And God will use our uselessness. Amen? And because of my uselessness, we laughed at each other. She even like, <laughs> and, and we talked. She opened up more. And she told me about her life. She told me about her struggles. She told me, I have six kids, Jem, from four different men. Two of her kids are autistic. That year, the 15-year-old and the 26-year-old kid. And I've seen how strong of a mother this girl is. 
And she told me about, about a struggle that she has right now with her present husband. They are in the Church of the Latter-day Saints. And she told me about, about her plans of divorcing her husband because her husband is somehow doing some physical abuse towards her, towards her kids. And my heart just broke. So she opened up to me for like two hours. We talked. And after, after uh, before we, we ended the conversation, the Lord somehow provoked me to, uh, no, convicted me. Jem, this is time to pray for her. So I asked her, Miss Melanie, can I pray for you? And when I was doing this, and Brother Craig, I need your hand. And when I told her, can I pray for you? She grabbed both of my hands and said, Jem, please do. And I prayed for her. And of course, I asked the Lord once again, Lord, this might be my last and only time to pray for this, for this soul. Please put the prayers on our lips. And I prayed for like one or two minutes. And when I opened my eyes, Melanie's face was filled with tears. And she gave me a huge hug after I said amen. A huge hug, a tight hug, that hug that would make your eyes pop out like <laughs> a tight hug. And then she told me, Jen, I really, really, really needed that. Thank you so much. And I left, walked away, and then I remember I have to do another selfie. <laughs> so I took, I took my phone and take another selfie of Miss Melanie. And this time, I could see the peace in her face. Yeah. Can you see her? That's her on your left. I'm the one on the right. Okay. <laughs> My dear friends, this is what happens when God takes hold of our plans. This is what happens when God takes hold of our lives. Sometimes we're thinking, oh, I'd lose a lot if I give all to the Lord. My dear friends, no, you lose a lot when you do not give your life to the Lord. The moment you withhold your life to the Lord, you'll be losing from that time on. The moment you give to the Lord, there's a time that you will have everything that He wants you to have, that you're allowed to have. I'm, I'm somehow burdened to share this. I share this with with Brother Jed, and Brother Jed told me, Jem, you need to share this to the church. Uh, back in 2016, I was really planning to, to raise funds for, I'm not saying this to you to raise funds. That fund was already raised just to give you, okay, a breather. <laughs> we have a convention back in the Philippines. It's called Philippine Youth for Christ. It's like GYC Philippines. And I'm part of the leadership of that group. And 2017, that was a few months ago, that's the convention that will happen in my hometown. We moved from Manila to my hometown because we look for other venues. And that's supposed to be the, the most expensive, most expensive uh, PYC that we'll ever experience. And, and I was invited to go to, to Canada last year. And the thing is, Remember, before I kneel, I kneel down and I, I ask the Lord and the Lord will provide the fare for the trips, somehow the Lord will always bring us to a higher walk with Him, Amen. to a higher surrender. Now, there's invitations, but there's no ticket. And I'll be flying from Philippines to Canada. Remember, how much do I earn again? Zero. Philippines to Canada, my dear friends, is expensive and I'll be flying on summer. So when I look at the ticket cost, the ticket cost 1,100 US dollars. And I look at what, what is in my bank. Yes, I have a bank account now. And when I look at my bank account, it's exactly the amount. And I'm thinking this bank account is for, is for PYC. And I consider that everything that I have is not, does not belong to me. It's for the ministry. But I was choosing my ministry. I'm thinking, Lord, this is for PYC. 
And I was just like conflicted right now. And I'm thinking, Lord, if they'll just buy my ticket, everything would be okay. And friends, there was an invitation, but there was no confirmation. There was not even a confirmation if I would speak, but they gave me three invitations in a row. And I was praying about it, and the Lord confirmed it, you should go. I processed my visa. It was already there, but still no confirmation. I informed the organization that I'm already ready with my visa, but they did not confirm if I'll go or not. But the Lord confirmed me, you have to go. So I bought my ticket. Friends, isn't it a crazy move to buy your ticket without any confirmation? And I asked the Lord, Lord, when do you want me to come to leave Canada? I'll be staying there in six weeks. Six weeks without any confirmation from them. But you know, friends, what happened? When the Lord says something, we have to obey. The moment I step forward, and this is one amazing thing, the Lord will not reveal to you the next move until you follow. Amen. So I bought the ticket, and the Lord was testing where my heart is. The Lord was testing how much will I give up for Him. And I said, okay, Lord, these are yours anyway. Isn't it true? Everything that we hold is God's anyway. Huh? Even your life. <laughs> it's not yours. It's his. So I, I moved forward and I paid the ticket. The moment I paid the ticket, the Lord opened up the door. I got an invitation to speak for the youth. For the youth was this divine service and the youth AY program. And the pastor heard that I'm coming. And then he said, okay, I'll give him my two morning devotionals. Make long story short, my dear friends, everything went amazing that they invited me one after another, and my six weeks was not enough. You know what the Lord did? The Lord multiplied what I have spent more than 10 times. Amen. Friends, I was able to pay the airfare of two speakers from Hawaii to the Philippines, two speakers from China to the Philippines and back. Does it make sense? Somebody who's earning zero is flying speakers from the U.S. going to the Philippines, when these things begin to happen, who gets the glory? God. God. Of course, they will not say, wow, Jem is so rich. Of course, no. They know I earn zero. Who gets the glory? Him. When we become zero, God becomes 100 in our lives, my dear friends. And once, you know what's amazing? Because the more I, I see this, the more it, it gives me this yearning, Lord, what do you require me to give some more? What is there left to, left to give? This is one amazing thing, my dear friends. I'll repeat it again. You could never outgive God. Amen. You could never, ever outgive God. Wow. You have to give. We are here. We have the resources not to hoard for ourselves. We have the resources to give it to God. And this is another amazing thing. Remember, I told you I went to North Dakota. Did I tell you that this morning? Yeah. I went to North Dakota, and I was invited to go to North Dakota in ASI by the pastor's wife. And the pastor's wife told me, Jem, uh, I'm sorry, I want to invite you to North Dakota, but our church is very small, really small. It's like one-fourth of your church here. And, and she asked me, so how much should we pay you to speak? And I said, the gospel is free, sister. I said, no, so, uh, no, 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 we want to ask you, how much is your uh, stipend? And I said, the Lord is my boss, so the Lord is the one who's, who takes care of my stipend. And since she said that her, her church is small, and then she asked me, so how about your airfare? I said, the Lord will take care of it. Friends, I spoke too soon. I forgot that I'll be flying from Honolulu to North Dakota. And then from North Dakota to California, and when I checked the ticket, Honolulu, North Dakota, California, 1,300 U.S. dollars. I'm thinking, oh, Lord, what should I do? And I praise God that I have a friend whose wife is working at Delta, and they managed for me to have a, a body pass. You know what a body pass is? A body pass, you should pay the, the least minimum amount, but you don't have an assigned seat. You will wait until everything, everyone sat in their, in their seats, and if there's extra seat, then you ride. And then my friend told me, Jem, 
you have to be sure that you don't have an appointment after Honolulu. You're going to North Dakota. I said, why? Because my, me and my wife somehow were able to fly out of Honolulu after three days. Because it's quite packed in Honolulu. And said, what? By God's grace, I was able to fly, to fly out. Because when God's ways are, are being followed, nothing could stop the Lord. And I have three empty seats beside me. God is good, isn't he? From Honolulu to North Dakota. So, and instead of 1300 I only paid $300. God is good. I was able to arrive in North Dakota. And friends, in North Dakota, when I got, uh, when I got in, by the way, before I even flew in, my host said, Jem, I hope you're prepared for the cold. I said, why? Yeah, it's zero degrees Fahrenheit here. I said, oh, Lord, that is so foreign for me. <laughs> when I arrived, it's not zero degrees Fahrenheit. There was a blizzard. It was negative 10. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, Lord, I'll be a frozen popsicle here. <laughs> but God is so good. He sustained me. I was able to stay in North Dakota even when the, the temperature went down to negative 21. I was able to make it, huh? Fahrenheit, not Celsius. And the kids thought that I was their playmate. They said, come, go sledding with us. No, I'll die. <laughs> they gave me pants after pants, suit after suit. They, they bundled me up that, that I could go sledding with them. My dear friends, I could barely walk. <laughs> It was an amazing time because that's where God wanted me to go. While I was there, you know what? Because of the blizzard, there's only like 12 people during our week of prayer. And we started instead of Tuesday. I got stuck in the airport because of the blizzard. Highways are closed. Instead of starting Tuesday night, we started Wednesday night. There were only like 12 people who attends. And during Sabbath worship, the church was just like... Uh, 50, 40 people who were there. And when I did the appeal, one person came forward. All of, almost all of them came forward. One person came forward, like wearing this, this suspender like, like Taylor. But he's wearing a shirt, like a three-button shirt, T-shirt and a white T-shirt and, and jeans. And he was crying. And he, he took my hand and gave me a rolled-up money. And that I usually have that experience. People will give me their last, their last money, like $1, $5, $10, rolled up money. And then he told me, use this for the Lord's ministry. And then I said, thank you, brother. I put it in my pocket. I even forget, forgot that I have that, that money in my pocket. I went to lunch, went to the bathroom before I spoke in the morning. I said, oh, I have money here. I checked that amount, my dear friends. That rolled up money was 17 pieces of 100 U.S. dollars. And I almost fell in the bathroom, <laughs> thinking, Lord, this is too much. I later on found out that that guy, he has not gone to the church for nearly two years. That was the first Sabbath that he came back to the church because the church split up. That's the first Sabbath that he came back to the church. And he is the owner of six oil wells in North Dakota. And there was one kid, a 14-year-old lanky 6'2 two, two kid, came to me and said, Brother Jem, the Lord spoke to me. I need to give you my offering. Use this for, for the ministry of the youth back in the Philippines. He did not even know about PYC. And he gave me this paper clip uh, that's clipping his money. And then I counted later on, it was 750 US dollars. The church collected, this small church collected, and they came up with more than 1,000 US dollars. Later on, I found out what I have given up, the $300, the Lord repaid it with more than 3,000 U.S. dollars. Is God amazing? Amen. And all the while, I was thinking when I paid for that ticket, I did not even think about any, any returns. Because when we're doing things for God, we should not be thinking about how can we be sustained we should be thinking only how can the gospel be preached. Amen? Amen? Amen. And let God do the rest. Amen. And you know what, my friends? It was amazing to see that God has more in store than we could ever imagine. 
that's the reason why I was, um, I was able to pay the speakers from Hawaii back to the Philippines. And I encouraged back, youth back home, and I told them, you know what? It's so amazing. Let's not charge any other expenses to the registration of, of people who will be attending PYC, especially the hotel accommodation of the speakers. Let's pay it ourselves. My dear friends, the people who are involved, the officers involved in PYC are like me. <laughs> Missionaries, students, and blue-collar job people. We don't have that much. And I told them, encourage them, let's have a, a self-denial box, self-denial fund. If we're thinking to go and eat somewhere else, let's skip that and let's put the money in that box. Let's give it to the Lord. And you know what happened? The Lord blessed the two mites of offering. The Lord somehow spoke to people, to individuals, and I got phone call, Jen, how can I send money to you? I have $500 for your ministry. It just flowed, my dear friends. Where did it start? From us giving. Before, my dear friends, we could ask from people around us, we should give ourselves. Amen? Amen? It's easy for us because what happens is when we see the Spirit moves, we see people giving. And now we see people giving and we're thinking, that's the way. That's the way to raise funds. Let's ask them to give. But giving should start from us. Amen. And by the way, remember I spent at 1,100 US dollars. And remember my deal with God is not to ask, not to borrow money, not to let people know about my need. But Sue, I just spent 1,100 US. Like that's the PYC fund. It was my money, but it was PYC's allotment. And I'm thinking, Lord, should I go and solicit? Should I go and ask money around? Because friends, in PYC, we need solicitors. We need donors. And the Lord somehow convicted me, Jem, what makes you think that I could not provide for PYC the way I'm providing for you? And then I said, okay, Lord, then no solicitation, no donation campaign. So I walked with shaking <laughs> knees, not knowing where we'll get the funding. But friends, this was the only year that we did not do any solicitation letter. And usually, every year what happens is, every single year we, were ab we, we will be able to pay off our major accounts like a week or a few days after the event when all has been collected. When all registrations, when all donations has been collected, that's when we will be able to pay. But this year, no solicitation campaign, no donation drive. And friends, this, this year has been the most expensive PYC. We were able to pay a week before the event. Wow. In the previous events, we don't, have to, we don't have to rent for Sabbath venue because we have 1,000 missionary campus church. This year, we have to rent a university auditorium, Catholic university auditorium, worth 2,000 U.S. dollars, all paid off before the event started. Our workshop is not just classrooms this time, it's hotel conference room, and we have to pay more than 1,000 U.S. dollars for that, all paid off. The food was paid off. We were able to sponsor nearly 40 young people who could not afford to go. Everything was paid off. And that Sabbath, Every Sabbath, remember when there, we have conferences like this, we have like offering plates distributed. Like, please help fund the conference. This year, I was convicted to go and speak, not to, not to campaign for offering, but somehow give a testimony of the Lord's faithfulness. And friends, usually we have like 10,000 pesos, 20,000 pesos. Last year was the biggest that we've had. It was 30,000 pesos something. But this year, remember, we did not even, I did not even promote, I, I did not even ask people to give. I just asked them. I just told them, this is how, what God has done to us. And this is what happens when we put God first. And I did not tell them that we need their money. You know, how much was the 
offering that was collected? 109,000 pesos. Friends, this is what happens when we ourselves sacrifice. Sacrifice begets sacrifice. Amen? Before we could even ask for people to give, we should be willing to give. And the Holy Spirit will be the one to touch those people to give. And this is one amazing thing because I'm not supposed to, to be giving so much because I'm not earning. Am I? I'm not earning. I'll tell you this. I don't usually tell this to people, but now the Lord has given me the conviction to share this with you. Last year, while I was going around for that seven months, the Lord had me give out to my fellow missionaries in other ministries an amount more than 3,000 U.S. dollars. That's aside from PYC. Isn't God amazing? Does that make sense? <laughs> Where will I get the money? <laughs> but every time the Lord puts the money in my hand, the Lord will tell me, give it to someone. Give it to someone. And it doesn't run dry. It doesn't run dry, my dear friends. We could not exhaust God. We could never exhaust God. If we want to see the work of the Lord go forward, we should be willing to spend and to be spent for God. There's no joy in hoarding. There's always joy in giving, my dear friends. God doesn't need your money. God needs your heart. God needs your heart. And where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I hope we put our treasures in heaven. Whenever the Lord opens a door for me to be invited, I don't even care if people will pay for my airfare or not. Because what happened this morning, what happened throughout this week, is more than any airfare. God will provide, and God has provided already. And God has taken care of my trips right now. Even at the end of this year, God has paid off everything. Isn't He amazing? Before, before the, e the year ends, all my airfare has been paid off. God is just beautiful. I tell you, when miracles begin to happen, when you give to the Lord, it doesn't go slow. It doesn't die out. God just escalates. Remember I told you I was, last year, four countries. This year, it's at least 10 countries that the Lord is bringing me back and forth. It's all being taken care of Him. You want to see God working in your life so powerfully. Amen. You need to, that people may see Him. That people may see Him through you. And you have to brag about Him. You have to tell people about how wonderful your God is. And this is one beautiful thing about testimonies. They could not argue about it. <laughs> they could not argue with your walk with God. That's your personal walk. And you know what happens? Their jaws will begin to drop. They'll begin to be bothered and to think, wow, there really is a God after all. Amen? Amen. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus, my friend. Amen. Just to take him at his word. Just to rest upon his promise. Just to know, thus saith the Lord. Take him seriously, friends. I think it's really proper to end our week of prayer with prayer. Amen? Amen. So get up from your, from your seat. Let's, let's gather around. Let's, let's be in this place. People who could not, who could not uh, kneel down, sit in the pews. People who have strong legs, kneel down with me. Come closer. Come, come close. Again, let's, let's keep our prayer short. Come, join us. You'll not, you'll not receive the blessing from, from afar. Come. 
we'll be praying four sections. The first section will just be our praises. Let's not go to prayer requests first. Let's, let's flood the gates of heaven with praises. Most of the time we come to him and give him our prayer request right away. And we forget most of the time how big our God is. Praises is not for him. Our praises is a reminder for us how powerful our God is. And next, and next part of our prayer session is, is confession. And our confession, there's two confession, a private confession and public confession. I encourage you to, to keep your private confessions private. Pray it silently. At public confessions, let's lift it up to the Lord. You know why I'm encouraging you to lift up your confessions as well to the Lord? Because most of the time, we forget things that we need to confess. But when we hear the prayers of other people, we, become in, we remind ourselves again, oh, Lord, thank you so much. I need to confess that too. And this is one of my favorite parts of, of the prayer session because in confession, we're somehow, we need to have a humble heart to come before the Lord and to be vulnerable in front of one another to admit that we that we ourselves are sinners as well. This is one beautiful thing about our church because this church is not a convent for the saints. This is a hospital for sinners. Amen? Amen. And thirdly, this is the time we will be asking for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Let's ask that the Lord will somehow unite us as a church that will be desirous of asking for the Lord's leading absolute reliance enough of our ways now his ways amen and lastly we will end it with with thanksgiving could you come closer even closer i know you're not filipinos but <laughs> come the lord is asking us to press together press together and every time we we transition from one section to another. I will sing a song so you will know which, which section we are in because I will be giving the instruction through the prayer as well. So my prayer will be a bit longer because it has, it has some instruction, especially in transition. And I encourage you to pray. What type of prayers? Short prayers. One or two sentence prayer only. Okay, let us bow our heads and let us sing this song. Into my heart, into my heart, come in.